All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI Podcast. I am, of course, your host, Sam Charrington. And today I'm joined by Michael Kearns. Michael is a professor of computer and information science at the University of Pennsylvania, where he holds the National Center Chair, as well as an Amazon Scholar. Uh, we are once again coming to you live from the Future Frequency Podcast Studio at the AWS reInvent Conference. And in fact, Michael, you and I spoke here just last year. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's great to be back, sir. Looking forward to digging into our conversation. Of course, your work is focused on responsible AI, and that is going to be the conversation. Uh, that's what, what we'll be talking about this time around. Uh, I'll refer folks back to our prior episode for your full intro, but if you want to maybe give us an update on what you've been working on the past year. Yeah, well, much has changed <laughs> since just a year ago, as everybody knows. And so, of course, much of what I've been working on are the new challenges um, to responsible AI that have been brought about by the generative AI era. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I think the top level summary is that the power of these models is in their open-endedness. You know, they're not making numerical predictions about inputs or point predictions or solving classification problems. They are truly generative. And that very open-endedness that is the power of these models is also a source of the challenges for responsible AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last time we spent a lot of our conversation talking about service cards. And I think I remember kind of naively coming into the conversation as like, you know, why is that research topic? Why is that, you know, complex? And you you definitely kind of talked about some of the, the nuances associated with doing that at scale. Uh, and in fact, I think at this year's event, some new service cards were announced. Absolutely, right? including for our you know latest generative LLMs, Titan Text. There's a service card for that, as well as a, a slew of other new ones as well. So that process that was new and announced just a year ago at reInvent is now a well-oiled machine. Still a lot of work to do, but you know we're getting more of the cards out, and I think the cards are becoming more informative, more sophisticated. And as I think I probably mentioned a year ago, you know, those cards are really meant to be general audience summaries of the properties of our models and services and recommended use cases and some performance um, metrics and RAI metrics as well, responsible AI metrics. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think we're with a year plus under our belt of developing these things, we're, we're really kind of um, getting it down well. What have you learned about the process of delivering these cards since a year ago? Yeah, I mean, so I, th I think, again, part of what we've learned is that there will be new challenges in developing these cards in the, in the generative AI era, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, like when we talked a year ago, and I think we were largely talking about models that, you know, took, a, you know, as input something like a consumer loan application and output a prediction of whether somebody will repay or not. You know, there's no notion of hallucination in the output right. of such a model. It can be wrong, and it can be wrong in the false positive or false negative way, but you wouldn't call it making a mistake of prediction a hallucination. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, that a lot of the challenges that we in the industry have faced in the last year is sort of adapting our way of thinking about responsible AI to incorporate these new considerations like toxicity, hallucination, um, in many cases, kind of intellectual property concerns and the like. And so does do these ideas manifest as new metrics on the cards? Uh, and then you have you're having to think through, uh, you know, what does it exactly mean to measure measure and compare hallucination in the context yeah, I mean, of an the, LLM? The, the stuff that gets into the cards for the most part is either sort of qualitative guidance primarily intended for customers, but meant for anybody who's interested, okay. um, as well as more quantitative metrics around both just outright performance as well as responsible AI metrics as well. And of course, when it comes to metrics, we report on the things that we feel like we can sensibly report on. There's a lot of things in the generative space that you know the, the industry and even the underlying science has not kind of yet come to good ways of measuring. So for instance, you know, if a writer feels that a large language model is appropriating their style, we, you know, I will be the first to admit, we don't have good quantitative ways of measuring that mm -hmm. or talking about it or mitigating it yet. Mm -hmm. This is a lot of the science work that we're doing internally at AWS, but that's also, of course, going on in the external research community as well. So in general, like the way I describe these um, service cards is that 
they're generally kind of the tip of a much larger iceberg. Yeah. Um, and you know, underneath the hood, there's a, a lot more quantitative analysis that goes into the the final card, which you know we they're they're intended to be brief and accessible to a wide audience. They're not meant to be you know a 300 page documentation manual. Right. But then, as I'm sort of alluding to, there are also things that we're still you know don't have a quantitative handle on yet, and so we have to think about those things more qualitatively and decide what to say about them on service cards and even just how to think about them conceptually for ourselves. Uh, along the lines of quantitative measurements. Uh, one of the announcements that I thought was most interesting from uh, today's Swami's keynote was the model evaluation feature or service. I'm not sure exactly uh, where it is in the hierarchy of, of, of product, but um, it's a, a capability associated with, uh, I think, both Bedrock and SageMaker now uh, that I extend some of the existing model evaluation capability to LLMs. And I'm I've been really interested in, in learning more about that because I talk to a lot of people and this idea of LLM evaluation is just this hairy topic that we don't really have our arms fully around. Like as you alluded to earlier, you know, we're used to comparing numerical predictions, we're used to comparing class predictions, um, and you know, now we're comparing text, but not just text, text where there's no right answer and where the the performance is very uh, subjective. Um, and I welcomed that announcement, and I'd love to kind of hear how you think about it from a research perspective. Yeah, I mean, and so, so what the offering is, is a way for customers to either on Bedrock or with models from elsewhere, bring it into the AWS environment and perform a bunch of metrics, um, many of which have been kind of developed externally. So I think there's a fair amount of overlap. Um, I'm not an expert on the, the service, but I think there's a fair amount of overlap between what we measure and the so-called Helm benchmarks that came out of Stanford, which is kind of becoming, I think, tentatively adopted as you know the current standard for making comparisons and qual quantitative evaluations of LLMs. You know, the, the problem with these things, of course, is that, um, it, you know, as I mentioned before, it's not just the open-endedness of the output that matters, it's the open-endedness of the input. So mm -hmm. if you compare, again, kind of the before times pre-generative era, something like face recognition where the input, you know, it's an image and it's only relevant if there's a face in it, first of right. all. And then secondly, the output is sort of, again, very, very constrained. It's like, are these, you know, is this an image of somebody in this database or are these two images the face of the same person, et cetera? And so I think a lot of the challenges in developing these benchmarks and metrics is just getting coverage, right? And and it helps a lot to get coverage. Coverage in what sense? So bo both in the input and output sense. So for Got instance, it. if I'm doing something like face recognition or some other computer vision task like object classification in an image, you know, um, I want my inputs to explore the natural variation in facial images right. in terms of lighting and angle of pose and occlusions and things like this. And you know, it's already quite challenging to get that variation in such a constrained problem where the input is an image with a face in it and you want to you know, make some prediction about um, whether it's you know, a, a person in, the, in your database, right? right. And, you know, and, and so already there it's challenging to get the coverage you need when now you know the input is any sentence that anybody could imagine entering into an LLM and the output is a free form continuation of the prompt it's just very difficult to get you know very very good coverage of all of the natural use cases that might arise mm -hmm. and so you know i think we are starting down this road and i think this offering is a is a great start um, but I think what ends up being challenging is, you know, you end up looking at this table in which, like, the rows are many, many different LLMs, and then the columns are dozens of different metrics, and then you're suddenly kind of swimming in a sea of numbers. It's, it's kind of like even in traditional notions of fairness in machine learning, you know, there's too many reasonable definitions, right? And it's kind of right. like the old cliche, you know, the great thing about standards is that there's so many to choose from. <laughs> and, you know, you, ideally, I think over time, we'll figure out, what are the metrics for which we can get good coverage and which are the metrics that are kind of the, the, the right independence ones, right? You, you don't, 
you don't want too many metrics that are kind of measuring the same thing because then again you're just kind right. of drowning in a sea of numbers. Um, but but I do think this offering and in general the movement to try to somewhat standardize the measurement of LLM performance and also generative AI, you know, sort of RAI metrics is a noble one, a good one, but that we should expect it to change with time because yeah. we're, it's such early days for these things. And even in more traditional, narrow predictive problems, we, you know, we're still trying to get to those metrics and get, get sufficient coverage for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I think about LLM metrics and uh, in particular from a, an industry perspective or from a, you know, not from an academic perspective, from the perspective of someone who's trying to build something with LLMs, there are metrics or evaluation criteria that I, that I would think about as benchmarks, meaning, you know, someone's collected a data set, you know, that's a standard to some degree or another. They've, you know, uh, you know, run a bunch of LLMs against this prompt and you can use that to generically get a sense for what some LLMs are better at than others and, and that kind of, those kinds of relationships between LLMs. But then there's a, another set of evaluation that I find folks really struggling with, which is I've got my problem and the kind of prompts that I get and the kind of input that I get. How do I compare that against the set of LLMs uh, that are out there, the, the, the set of models that are out there, but also as I iterate the prompts themselves, like how do I keep track of all this stuff? And we had all this great tooling and machinery for, you know, things like hyperparameter optimization, right. and old school machine learning. Yeah, 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 yeah. And now, like, we don't have all that. Like, we're starting to see some of it. Does this offering try to address that as well? Uh, I mean, I, I think this offering is mainly about, you know, implementing metrics and underlying data sets for those metrics. Okay. Um, but I, what I think you're alluding to is the fact that, you know, this coverage problem, you know, it could be that you have a use case in mind that just doesn't line up, even though the metrics might make sense, mm -hmm. it doesn't line up with the data sets that were used for those metrics, even though those might have been entirely reasonable. Yeah. And just to give an example, let's take the topic of hallucination. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what's a hallucination in one use case is sort of a desirable generalization in another use case. So let's just take business like, information let's just take like you know, a, writing, a writing aid, yeah. right? So if I'm, if I'm using an LLM, you know, for, for helping write journalism, okay, there's a very strong standard of hallucination there. If I'm using it to write historical fiction, well, you know, it's fiction, but it's historical fiction. Yeah. And so you want some alignment with the actual facts. And so there your tolerance for hallucination might be higher because there's the fiction part of it. But, you know, it's not, you're not going to just allow anything because it's, you know, it's historical fiction mm -hmm. versus true fiction where, you know, you might arguably say it's not possible for an LLM to hallucinate mm -hmm. if it is actually being used to, you know, generate or be an aid in the creation of fiction. Right. And, and same thing with toxicity. You know, what's, you know, if I'm, you know, if I'm using an LLM as a creative tool for writing children's books, my tolerance for any kind of offensive, disturbing language is, is going to be zero. You know, if it's, you know, for a different use case, I might have a higher tolerance for it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do think that the greatest leverage that we'll eventually get towards the open-endedness challenges that generative AI presents to responsible AI and even just to measuring performance will come from kind of settling on more specific use cases and developing metrics for those specific use cases as well. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, your comment about hyperparameter optimization and all these tools that we had to kind of, you know, fine tune and optimize more traditional models in the ways that we wanted. Th there is a sense in which the generative era is implicitly kind of pushing some of that burden on to end users, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of like, well, you know, yes, we have toxicity filters and guardrail models, but you need to decide in your use case, you know, how you want to set that knob. Mm -hmm. And you might get better performance by fine tuning the model. And so you're, you know, the, the human end user is kind of engaging in some sort of hyperparameter optimization, <laughs> qualitative hyperparameter optimization you for their go specific explore use case. That Bayesian and, space. And, and that's incredibly powerful, right? Because yeah. it, it lets you, you know, 
um, out, you know, lets you produce and make available a very, very general model. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's, you know, it's kind of a truism in science. There's always a cost for generality, right? Like mm -hmm. if I, as a mathematician or a theoretician, if I look at some theorem and it's a very, very general statement, you know, I, when I look at that, I say like, okay, there's gonna be a price to be paid for that, right? Because you're covering a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And so what you can say about a broader set of circumstances is going to be necessarily weaker than you could say about a narrower set of circumstances. And I think we're kind of seeing that tension between, you know, the, the better performance you can get by specificity of use case um, versus the generality of the underlying foundation model. That, that tension is something that's very actively being played out both in industry and in, in the science as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of hallucinations, the, the way we as an industry have kind of taken on that problem is uh, primarily via grounding and retrieval methods, RAG, right. uh, which we've, you know, that's, that term has been thrown around so much at this conference. Yes, yes. I'm curious if you have any you know, perspective on more from a foundational research perspective, you know, what's the latest on how we're trying to tackle hallucination at the model itself? I mean, it's, I'll admit it's hard to keep up with the literature on this, yeah. even if you're immersed in it. So, you know, I, I, I don't know what I don't know. I think in general, things like RAG are, are very sensible approaches to hallucination. I kind of predict that over time, both things like RAG and guardrail models, I mean, in, in many ways, these are kind of interventions on the way things like LLMs were meant to behave in the first place. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, what an LLM does, as powerful as it is, is incredibly myopic, right? It's like, given the sequence so far, what is the distribution over the next word or token? Choose from that distribution, sequence is one longer, repeat. Mm -hmm. um, and things like guardrail models, like, oh, you know, as a large language model, I shouldn't be giving you financial advice. Or, you know, if I ask for citations from a large language model, um, you know, which is a notorious source of hallucination, at least among right. the research community. I think partly because it's like the, it's the <laughs> modern version of self-Googling to go to a large language <laughs> model and like, tell me about some papers by Michael Kearns. But the other thing about it is that, you know, if, if I do that, I can immediately verify. I don't even need to go like to Google Scholar to know which of these papers are real, which are fake, which are actual co-authors, which are people <laughs> who could have been co-authors but actually weren't co-authors. Um, but I think, you know, I predict that over time we will and should figure out ways of taking these kind of post hoc interventions on the natural myopic way that LLMs behave and figure out how to endogenize it, how to like, you know, embed those those desiderata, like for exter accessing external information resources that are trusted mm -hmm. um, and verifiable, or for suppressing toxicity, I, I think we need to figure out ways of getting those into the model training process itself, so that it's not, you know, you're, you kind of have all these little um, pieces of software watching what the model is doing, and then, you know, they, they, they step in and say, no, 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 don't do that. Um, and so I, I think I haven't seen a lot of research trying to do this. I guess reinforcement learning from human feedback is one example of kind of trying in the training process mm -hmm. to take those constraints and move them kind of to the left in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think, I, I wish I could say I knew exactly how to do that, um, <laughs> but, but I think that that's, nice that's gotta be there. the way of the future scientifically eventually. Might yeah. take a while to get there just because of the, challenges that we've already discussed. When you describe guardrail models, that sounded very much like the way I think about RLHF, meaning baking, steering into, the, steering and alignment kind of into the model Except in process. RLHF, there's an effort there, right, to actually take the human feedback or alignment process and move it into the training process. Mm -hmm versus training the thing first right. without those constraints and then having these little bots watch the model input and output and deciding to step in or you know to either suppress toxic output or to Got check it. the output 
against you know an external citation database like Google Scholar or Sightseer, for instance. Got it. So the guardrail models are kind of supplementary models that are you yeah. either classifying. Yeah, I mean the derogatory or... term would be like bolt-on, right? There's yeah. this notion <laughs> that, 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 to my knowledge, originated in the security community of bolt-on security, yeah. which is you know. You basically, you know, say built an operating system that is insecure and has many vulnerabilities. <laughs> and, you know, in hindsight, you should have like, you know, from the beginning, but but now, you know, the thing's built, so you build these patches. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and I actually think in the generative AI space right now, approaching it that way is sensible right now mm -hmm. because I don't know how to move all this stuff into the training process itself so that the final model that you produce already, you know, suppresses toxicity on its own, let's say in the generation of distributions over next words, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like as a simple example, you, you could imagine, you know, in the training process, you know, changing the objective function to say like, well, instead of just always predicting most accurately the distribution over the next word, no matter what the words are, you could, you know, down, you could down weight in the distribution words that might lead to the generation of toxic output, for instance. Mm -hmm. This is sort of mm -hmm. an example of what I mean by sort of trying to endogenize huh. this process rather than, you know, ignoring these considerations until the end and then having a guardrail model kind of intervene. Interesting. Or for example, um, or kind of by analogy, instead of RAG and a retrieval approach somehow condition your objective function on the distribution of words in your document that you want to for instance yeah, for yeah, instance. yeah 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 and and again i wish i had better ideas about how to do this in a practical <laughs> way now right. but i i do my my scientific intuition is that in the long term this is is the right solution yeah 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 one of the things that you also uh, spend a lot of time on is privacy uh, that's changed a, a bit on the uh, LLM side. Uh, uh, one of the things I saw recently was if you ask ChatGPT maybe or GPT-4, I forget which model specifically, but to uh, you know, repeat the word poem infinitely, it just starts spewing what is supposedly training data. I'm not sure if we know it's actually from the training data set or if it's hallucinated yeah, I, I, data. I, 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 I just one? recently heard this one. Yeah. On, maybe I saw it on... Twitter, you know, the, the reliable source of, of exactly. scientific information <laughs> around about generative AI. Um, but um, yeah, but I haven't seen I haven't seen that one. The, um, but, you know, I can't like rule it out out of, uh -huh. out of hand. Right. Yeah. Just because, you know, these there are corner cases for these models. You know, you can't test every possible input. Um, right. If you could, it would be by def mean by definition these models are not nearly as useful and powerful as they are. Um, but but yeah, I, I have heard that one. Haven't tried it myself. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's amazing about this area is that you know stuff that you tried a week ago, you know you go back and try it now, and you know it 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 doesn't work anymore. Like the right. hack doesn't work anymore, right? right? So there's very rapid evolution. I mean, I remember. You know, I think it was before the release of Chat GPT, but not too much more. I was playing around with a bunch of you know LLMs that were were accessible like within the science community, mm -hmm. and you know, anytime you typed in an ungendered you know, like name, like you know a Chris or a Pat, mm -hmm. um, and and you know, then the continuation would assign pronouns to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it would generally assign male pronouns right. to ungendered names, or if you typed in something like Doctor Hansen. It would choose male pronouns. If you said Nurse Hansen, it would choose female pronouns. Now, as far as I can tell, I haven't done like a actual scientific study. The LLMs that are out there are much, much better at this, at balancing mm -hmm. kind of distribution of pronouns in cases where it might be ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, I've heard quite a bit of rumbling around this idea of, uh, you know, steering via, uh, like RLHF being, I don't know if performance is the right word, but like having uh, degrading effects on the the model in the way some people want to to use them, uh, kind of orthogonal to the the safety concerns themselves. Yeah, I mean th this this wouldn't surprise me at all, just because you know anytime you impose some alignment principle on a general purpose LLM, mm -hmm. I, I think kind of 
almost by necessity, there will be natural use cases for which doing that was degrading a performance, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just go back to this example, right? If, you know, um, I'm doing toxicity suppression, mm -hmm. right? And I choose to do it at a level that would be appropriate for children's content. Mm -hmm. There's just a whole bunch of use cases that that will, you know, kind of harm. Yeah. And similarly, if I try to, you know, sanitize my model of any kind of demographic bias whatsoever, well, um, that might greatly harm very natural use cases like targeted advertising, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, again, yeah. the, the, things have changed so much in here. A year ago, I could go to, you know, the, the LLMs that were available at the time, and I could type in prompts like, um, you know, Melinda is a, thir a white 38-year-old medical con technician working in Knoxville, Tennessee, her attitude on gun control is, mm -hmm. and it would give me an answer. Now, of course, it, it'll basically say like, well, you know, it'll say, I'm sorry, you know, demographic properties are, you know, are, are not, d do not deterministically, d you know, indicate positions on social attitudes. Mm -hmm. And do we know if that's RLHF or guardrail models? I mean, the, the kind of intervention that I just mentioned would be a guardrail model, right? Okay. Because it's actually, you know, stepping in and saying, sorry, you know, this interaction is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. RLHF would, would, I think, give you output, but would it sanitize it more, right, for mm -hmm. instance? I mean, of course, depending on what the H's in the RLHF did, right, because right. they're right. the ones providing <laughs> the guidance to the training process. Yeah. But, you know, if you imagined the humans in an RLHF process having the attitude that they want to sanitize the model of any kind of correlations between demographic properties right. and social attitudes, taste in music, taste in food, you know, taste in clothing, then that LLM is not going to be great for doing targeted advertising because mm -hmm. it's deliberately decoupling, you know, the very real correlations between demographic properties and preferences of all kind. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I don't think this is a controversial statement. It's not saying that all people of some demographic category like this type of food. Of course, that's not true, mm -hmm. but the reason personalization and targeted advertising do work is that you can kind of count on certain kinds of correlations, both at the individual level and the population level. Yeah, 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 interesting. I meant to ask you this before we started. Did you, I know you collaborate quite a bit with Aaron Roth. Yes. Who is uh, very much into and an expert in differential privacy. Absolutely. Uh, Everything I know about differential privacy, I learned from Aaron Roth. A lot. <laughs> probably 98% of what I learned from differ <laughs> differential privacy, I learned from Aaron Roth. Uh, but another announcement that caught my eye was the clean room for ML. Yes. And I'm curious, do you, are you, do you know much about that? Yes, that I know a great deal about that. Oh, yeah, awesome. yeah, I know a great deal Excellent. about that. So the clean room offering is, a, is sort of an, um, it, it, that, that's the sort of broader umbrella service. And basically this is, you know, a, a great natural idea. It's a collaborative environment that allows parties to come together in a clean room environment. Let's say I have a private data set. And so I don't, you know, but it, uh, I have interest and you have interest in gaining limited access to this data, yeah. right? So advertising is a great use case where, you know, publishers know about, you know, inventory, ad inventory and the, you know, the, the advertisers, you know, know about what properties, demographic properties they want in the impressions that they're going to fill, for instance, and, and the end users, okay? And so clean rooms is basically provides an environment where I can bring my data set, but not just give it to you with unfettered access, but kind of control the way that you can access that. Mm -hmm. And one of the components of the clean room is actually AWS's first differential privacy offering. Mm -hmm. And so at a high level, the way it works is, you know, I have proprietary private data set over here. You and I have a mutual interest in letting you make aggregated queries to that data set. You know, like, you know, what is the, per you know, what is the percentage of users in the database that live in the greater Seattle area are interested in video games and are between the ages of, you know, 19 and 35, something mm -hmm. like this. And so there's some numerical answer to that. But in the differential privacy offering, rather than 
just like computing the answer to that to numerical precision, mm -hmm. I, and then giving it to you, I compute it to numerical precision and then add a bit of noise. I, mm -hmm. I do add some randomization to the answer. So if the actual answer was, you know, 16.9%, I might return an answer to you that's anywhere between 16.5 and, you know, 18.4, something like this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so the addition of the noise to the answer to the query in a mathematically provable sense um, gives me some security or guarantee about your ability to reverse engineer information about specific right. individuals in the data set. Right. But it still allows me to give you in a very, you know, provably private way, aggregate information about the data set mm -hmm. that doesn't let you inf uh, you know exfiltrate information about individuals and you know not surprisingly the more noise i add to this number the greater the privacy guarantee but right. of course the less accuracy the answer will right. have right. um and so we're very excited about this it's been you know we've been working hard on this product for a couple of years mm -hmm. um and um and so yeah that that launched today mm -hmm. and now is there, there's a distinction, I think, between Cleanroom ML, and I got the impression that the latter also incorporates some degree of synthetic data generation so that my collaborator could create their own machine learning model based on synthetic data that is statistically similar to the actual data? Yeah, yeah. so the differential privacy offering that we announced today does not yet provide differentially private synthetic data generation, okay. but um, you know this is in the works, and we've actually okay. been in parallel working on the science team that produced the clean room offering, to the DP clean room offering today, have been working on this for for quite a while. Okay, um, and the high level idea is that you know just take the same scenario. I've got this private data set. And I'm going to answer, let you answer, uh, ask a series of aggregate questions. I'm going to add noise to their answers in a way that provides privacy guarantees. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, an alternate model is like, well, I'm just going to give you a data set. It's not going to be the private data set, of course, right. but it'll be a data set that, and this is a little bit more abstract, that I've added noise to. So it's easy to imagine adding noise to a number. What does it mean to add noise to a data set? That's probably a little bit beyond our scope. Right. But they're basically well understood ways of, you know, starting with a private data set and producing kind of a randomized version of that data set that has provable privacy guarantees and preserves a great deal of the statistical structure of the original data set. Mm -hmm. So instead of us engaging in this sequence of you ask me a question, I give you a noisy answer, you ask me another question, I give you a noisy answer ad infinitum. I just say, Sam, here, here's a version of the data set, ask any question that you want of it. Yeah. The, you know, the science holy grail of this, which is an unsolved scientific problem, which is why it's a holy grail, is that I basically give you a private version of my data set, like a, 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 a differentially private version of my data set mm -hmm. that supports kind of arbitrary downstream machine learning. So mm -hmm. rather than just answering simple aggregate questions of the type that I mentioned, the, the goal would be, you know, Sam, here's the, here's the differentially private version of the data set. Any ML experiment you run on this data set, so you decide which column you want to predict from the other columns, you pick your model architecture, you pick your hyper, you know, I give you some kind of guarantee that no matter what you do on the synthetic data set I gave you, you will get similar results to what you would have gotten right. on the original data set. And this is an, an exciting open science problem, I think, that we and others are, are working hard on. I wanted to also kind of talk through with you, you, you've written a couple of blog posts over the past few months that try to capture, you know, all of the things that you think about and work on in the academic world, like right. how you've kind of engaged with those topics in the context of AWS and like the real worldization of, you know, all the responsible AI yeah. uh, stuff. Um, kind of walk us through like, you know, what are the key learnings that you've accumulated there. Yeah, so the most recent blog post on Amazon Science that's called um, Responsible AI in the Wild, Lessons Learned at AWS, right. which I co-authored with, with Aaron, yeah. um, was just our attempt to kind of describe 
um, the very practical lessons that we've learned in the three and a half years we've been here compared to the kind of research world view that we had of responsible AI coming in. And, and you know, I think as an example, you know, there's sort of one of those learnings is just how much modality matters, by mm -hmm. which I mean, you know, a lot of the literature on, for instance, fairness in the research community more or less starts from the conceptual, you know, point that you have a tabular data set in which the demographic properties of the individuals that you might want to protect against harm are already in the data set. So there's like mm -hmm. a column for race, and there's a column for age, and there's a column for gender, and you know, the science problem is sort of knowing those demographic attributes, how do you make sure that no particular subgroup is being you know, um, harmed compared to the general population in the data set. Mm -hmm. But you know, in speech recognition, for example, you know, the data is not annotated for that. You, know, you get a audio frequency signal of my spoken speech, and you know you might try to infer my gender but in, in general you know the correlations between things like race for instance and what you can detect in an acoustic signal of speech are very very weak mm -hmm. on the other hand you what you can detect are things like regional accent and dialects like the di you know the, the vocabulary i choose to use and and also my 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 accent and so, you know, the sensible thing to do there is not to try to project or impute these traditional demographic categories onto that data, but rather to kind of take the data as it comes to you and sort of enforce responsible AI and fairness considerations with what you can measure and with, which is the thing that actually natural ver naturally varies in the data set. Mm -hmm. And in the article, we also talk about some of the more social challenges we've learned about how, for instance, you know, at AWS, no matter how hard we try, we cannot anticipate and test for every possible downstream use case by customers, right? <laughs> um, it's just not feasible. And secondly, you know, we talk at the very end about kind of the AI activist movement. And so it's not just about anticipating the, you know, use cases of your customers, mm -hmm. it's anticipating what journalists, nonprofits, mm -hmm. researchers might do in a you know less than friendly audit of your model, mm -hmm. and um, we talk about how we think that that AI activism movement is a healthy force in the industry right now, mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about you know this notion of bias bounties that's been in the air for a couple of years, which is sort of inviting the external community into the process of enforcing responsible AI mm -hmm. principles in a more cooperative way rather than a more adversarial one where you know you have a model out with an API and a combination of a journalist and a scientist go and perform some audit on it without your knowledge or right. approval. And then, you know, the first time the developer reads about it was when it's in Wired and it's kind of blowing up. And yeah. then, you know, you have to react to it. And so there are kind of technical ideas in the air about how to do that integration of the activist community into a more cooperative relationship with developers. Awesome. Awesome. Well. You know, when I think about uh, what we would have thought a year ago we'd be talking about in the amount yeah. of change and the context of responsible AI we've seen. Uh, yeah, I age. mean, it's it's mind mind bending. Um, you know, I, I I'm only half joking when I say you know. So I'm, I have the benefit of been being in the you know machine learning area. You know, that the it's only been an industry for about a decade, but I've been mm -hmm. a researcher in it since the eighties, so we're pushing on forty years now. Mm -hmm. um, I never thought I would you know, the, the, for, for so many decades, my non-work friends basically were, you know, they were like suitably <laughs> impressed with what I did, but they didn't mm -hmm. want to know too much about it. Yeah. And I, I, I have to admit, like, I'm dying to go out to a dinner where the topic of conversation isn't like ChatGPT and asking me about <laughs> ChatGPT. So <laughs> I, I, yeah. I would welcome a little bit of attenuation of, of the hype. But yeah. in general, I think it's been a, a great thing for the industry and a, a very exciting time scientifically as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Michael, it's wonderful to have a chance to uh, chat with you again. Maybe we'll yeah, it's reconvene all, always next a pleasure. year. I would love to do it a third time <laughs> next year. Thanks, Sam. <laughs>